and uh, they have received a lot of support and they have been told how to do things and how to do things well. What is feedback? Obviously, this is an example of feedback. Any test that's been graded and we get an A, B, C, D, uh, correct, incorrect, or anything. That's the most standard kind of feedback. This is also feedback. This is actually one of my colleagues from Kiev um, doing feedback in one of his lessons, where normally in a speaking activity, we'll listen to our learners, take notes of what they are saying, and then we write things on the board and let them decide if the things are correct or incorrect. And if things are incorrect, they have to improve. That's also some feedback. A simple motivational post-it note saying good job, a smile, a sticker given to a young learner. That's also some sort of feedback. And we're going to talk about what kind of feedback that is a little bit later. And this is also feedback, either immediate or delayed that learners get on their performance. That definition is taken from Thornbury's The New A to Z of ELT. And that's what we normally see in an English language classroom. If we look at a dictionary definition, um, feedback in general is comments about how well or how badly someone is doing something. And those comments are intended to help them do it better. However, if we scroll down and look at the second definition, it says that feedback originally is the high loud noise that electrical equipment makes when part of the sound that it sends out goes back into it. So imagine a um, microphone and you're saying something into the microphone and from the loudspeakers you can hear this annoying something and that's the kind of feedback uh, that's the kind of thing which was originally named feedback. So that's anything that tells us what we're doing and how we're doing it. And, and over to you now. Um, what different kinds of feedback have you received in life? And how do you like to receive feedback? I'm just going to ask you to type your answers into the chat box and I'm going to read um, some of those, the ones I see because there's so many. Um, so verbal feedback, direct, indirect. Okay, can you give can you give any specific examples? Maybe something like my teacher told me I did well. Um, gray, a grade, okay, positive, negative. Ah, a greeting card, okay, smiles, perfect. Okay, I can see a lot of verbal feedback and definitely that's very common. However, there are other types of feedback which we're going to talk about. Smiles, signals, stickers, thumbs up. Yes, absolutely. Good. How do you like to receive feedback? Uh, written feedback, oral, somebody says directly. Okay, that's a very common thing. On CELTA courses, I often have this a uh, question from trainees, can we get more direct feedback? Can you tell us what to do and how to do things? And that's a, that's a very interesting point to discuss. Okay. So some people are saying, I like direct feedback. I like positive feedback, personal feedback. Yeah, good. Okay. Oh, flowers and chocolate. That's a very good example. Okay, good. So um, yeah, there's lots of different things um, and feedback is everywhere. It's all around us. And when I was thinking about it, I wanted to classify feedback into categories, which we're going to cover in this webinar. So here is what I have come up with. Feedback can be verbal and nonverbal. That is, it can come in words or something else. It can be positive or negative. We're all familiar with that. It can be written or oral. And in an English language classroom, feedback normally comes as feedback on form and feedback on content or feedback on performance and other things. But that's the standard definition we use in CELTA. There's also feedback and feed forward. 
which we're going to talk about later. And another important point I wanted to cover is feedback that's constructive and feedback that's counterproductive. Um, so let's start from verbal and nonverbal. And we definitely do quite a lot of that uh, in an English language classroom. And <clears throat> apart from the verbal feedback, which comes in words, um, we have quite a lot of things which are nonverbal. And in the online uh, environment, which we're all in um, at this very moment, there are lots of things which help us with feedback. For example, facial expressions often show how a teacher feels about what the students are doing. And tone and pitch of voice, um, they have to correspond to what we're saying. If we're saying, good, good, in a very positive manner, that kind of sends a message that we are being honest. However, sometimes we can say, good, and which means that we're not exactly, um, we don't exactly mean what we're saying. Body language as well. Um, we can be open and have thumbs up and things like that, uh, or we can be very reserved and that also sends some feedback. Silence is another kind of feedback. Sometimes it means that we might not be listening. Um, sometimes it means that we don't agree. Sometimes it means that we're giving time to think. Being on camera makes it even more difficult. And seeing your own face uh, makes it weird. When we are in an English language classroom, we don't see ourselves. Uh, we see our students and we kind of read their body language. We read their facial expressions and we're focusing on that. When we're teaching online, if we have our camera on and we, if we can see ourselves, it makes it very, very weird for us to be focusing on so many other people as well. Uh, social distancing, which we're all experiencing at the moment, is another difficult thing because what happens is everything has moved online and we have our classes online, we have our meetings with our bosses online, but we also have our meetings with our friends online. So imagine your standard classroom at your own school and imagine that there in the morning you're teaching your students and then later on you have a meeting with your boss and then in the evening you invite your friends for a pizza party and you watch a movie in the same English language classroom. It makes it very very difficult to distinguish between a workplace and some private space which also has quite a lot of feedback, uh, impact on the feedback we give. It kind of, th there's been this concept of all eggs being in one cognitive basket, which means that everything is um, happening in the same place now. So for us, it's very, very difficult to switch from the personal or home mode into the teaching mode. We have to keep a straight face. We have to keep, put on a smile whenever it's needed in a classroom. Why? Um, there's been a lot of research conducted recently and it has been discovered, you see the link down there so you can check it, that delays on phone or conferencing system of as much as um, 1.2 seconds, that, that's a very, very short period of time, makes people perceive the other people less friendly or less focused. If we don't get a response immediately, we see, we think that people aren't listening to us. Um, when we teach higher levels, we often teach our students things like tech questions and back channeling as devices which show that we are listening and we're following a conversation. Now imagine a standard conversation or a standard lesson in which a learner says something and then there's a 1.2 second delay before you hear what they have said. And then there's the same 1.2 second delay before they hear what you are saying. There's this long, long period of silence, which, as I mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases is perceived as you're not listening. So when teaching online, we have to pay very much attention to what we do as nonverbal feedback. 
particularly because this delay makes the other people perceive us as unfriendly. Some people might argue with me and might argue with this and say that we shouldn't be smiling a lot and we shouldn't be praising our students a lot. There's this common thing um, of don't smile until Christmas, which I'm sure a lot of young learners teachers are familiar with. We say that if you want to establish a very good classroom management routine, we should start by being strict and establishing very, very clear rules. And then later on, by Christmas, we can start smiling, being friendly and doing other things. That might be true. However, People like Rita Pearson, who talk about um, the atmosphere in the classroom and how people learn, and particularly how children learn, say that kids and people don't learn from the people they don't like. And smiling, praising and being positive are generally the things which help us establish the rapport. So without this, it would be very difficult to make the children uh, like us and um, to actually establish, establish the rapport needed um, for good learning. Um, that's a fantastic TED talk, by the way, in which um, Rita Pearson talks about the fact that kids need their heroes and they need people, they need someone to learn from. And not only kids. Um, you will notice that uh, um, in a lot of cases, um, in our lessons, learners pick up things from us which we don't intend to teach. And there's this lovely saying which says, um, input doesn't always mean intake. Um, so that's if we're teaching present simple or present continuous. It doesn't necessarily mean that this is the only thing our learners uh, learn from us in this lesson. They sometimes pick up nice phrases, um, something we do as part of giving instructions, something that we do as part of classroom management or a simple um, exchange. And, you know, they make a little note and they use it later. And then like two weeks later, you hear this word and you think, oh, wow, where did they get it from? Um, so all this is to say that if we're positive, if we do a lot of nonverbal positive feedback, our learners get a lot more from us and they become a lot, a lot more motivated, especially online. Let's remember that oh, we have to show a lot more online than we do in a face-to-face -face classroom. So moving on to the next point of being positive and negative, which kind of links to what I just said um, about not smiling until Christmas. Um, positive and negative feedback. We all know that things like well done uh, is an example of something positive and things like you, can you correct that please is something more neutral and no that's not right is negative feedback but why is it important uh, to us and and how how does it work in our brain um there is this common belief that our brain doesn't accept uh the particle not so if we say don't go there what our brain hears is go there um, and it, it, there's a lot about it in psychology and, and other areas. Um, but when you think about it from the point of view of how our, how our brain works um, in terms of biology and psychology, um, there's, again, this very interesting research which says that there are two hormones, um, dopamine and cortisol. And here, this is to represent dopamine. Dopamine is the hormone which is responsible for, uh, in very broad terms, feeling happy and motivated. And in terms of learning, dopamine is the hormone which helps us stay motivated and want to do things. So researchers say that if our learners hand in a piece of writing um, and they, the, which they did as part of homework, and we take it and we keep it and we give them feedback, let's say two days later or three days or a week later, their brain has already forgotten about the kind of work and the amount of work it has done as part of doing this writing. So when they get their feedback, their writing back, they do get some positive emotions, but 
if they hand in a piece of writing and we give them feedback immediately or almost immediately, their brain releases quite a lot of dopamine and it, remember, that's a hormone for happiness, and it helps them stay motivated and want to do even more writing. So this very, very common complaint, my students don't want to do writing, maybe that's because they're not very motivated, because writing is the kind of thing which we don't get the feedback for immediately. So the rule from here, which I have personally, uh, um, which, which I want to personally accept as something very important, is whenever we get something, we should be giving feedback as soon as possible, which is not always um, the case and which we can't always do, uh, but should aim, uh, should aim for. I also mentioned the other hormone, cortisol. Um, why does that matter? So imagine a situation in which our learners have said something or have given us a piece of writing and we have graded it immediately and we give it back and they see a full piece of uh, write, a piece of writing full of red marks and corrections. That's kind of an that, that's kind of negative feedback. And what has just happened in our brain is uh, we have received quite a lot of dopamine because we have received feedback. But we have also received a portion of cortisol, which is a hormone for stress. So a mixture and our brain basically goes crazy. Um, what happens when we get a lot of cortisol is that it, I want to say, um, damages or hurts the um, parts which are responsible for releasing the hormones. And we start getting less and less dopamine. So that's a very, very dangerous path to follow. Whenever we give feedback, especially if we give immediate feedback, we should aim to word it in a positive way so that we do not damage, literally damage, our learner's uh, biology. But is it all about biology? Basically, yes. If we want to um, boil it all down to the very, very basic concepts, we respond to words uh, in terms of how our body works. And later on in this webinar, we're going to see how we can make more negative comments into more positive comments, which will motivate uh, the learners uh, to keep going. So how about feedback on form and feedback on content? And from here on, we're going to work with specific examples, um, uh, which we're going to later uh, try and transform a little bit. So I'm going to show you uh, a list of examples of pieces of feedback. And I'd like you to think about those. Are they examples of feedback on content or feedback on form? Um, for instance, if we have asked our learners to speak to their partner and decide whether they uh, agree or disagree on a point, um, and then later on we ask, so did you agree with your partner? That would be an example of feedback on content because we're interested in what they did and the content of what they did. Um, and if we have noted down some of their errors and some examples of good language, and later on we write it on the board um, and ask the learners to correct, that's an example of feedback on form. So have a look at my next slide, have a look at those examples and decide if they are examples of feedback on content or feedback on language or the form, as we say. So um, look at those. Um, and send your answers into the chat, please. You can simply write, somebody has started doing that already. Uh, you can simply write C for uh, content um, and L for language. Yeah, some people are already writing things. One content, two content. Okay. One, two, three content. Yes, all right, good. Mm -hmm. Yep. For language, mm -hmm. maybe. 
five language six language okay i'll give you a bit here so you'll see that i've grouped them into uh the three pieces of feedback on content and then the other pieces are uh, feedback on language it's just to make it simpler and yes when we ask learners about things other than um, the linguistic uh, or the skills parts they used in their performance uh, that's all feedback on content and also when we tell the learners that we enjoyed reading their essays that's also feedback on content all the others are examples of feedback on language and you will see that um, in number four for instance this is a general um, a very very general example it can be vocabulary can be grammar so that's uh, a simple gap fill exercise which is very common in course books um, you'll see that um, number five is a piece of reflection in which we're focusing on grammar um, as well as number six uh, that's also focusing on grammar. While number seven and eight are examples of feedback on pronunciation. And when we talk about feedback uh, given on language, we need to remember that it's not all about grammar. Um, quite often when I observe lessons, I see that teachers write sentences with uh, very common errors such as present perfect, past simple, omission of articles and mistakes like that. Uh, but in a lot of cases we forget about uh, pronunciation and I often remind myself and remind my trainees that um, language is not all about grammar and if we can uh, spot some pronunciation errors and deal with those it's always a good idea after we do a speaking activity to write a word which was pronounced with a mistake and then model it, say it a couple of times and then have everyone repeat this word and try and practice saying it, which we call drilling. Um, so that will help the learners become uh, more motivated. Um, the other example is we, we can sometimes hear phrases like, I think, I think, I think, which our learners use quite a lot. And um, which is fine, uh, but if we can, what we say, what we call stretch or upgrade their language, um, that would also work for their benefit. So if we give them the phrase, I think on the board, and then ask them to uh, come up with more examples, some synonyms to this phrase, um, that will work as a kind of feedback as well. Um, I can see some questions in the chat, which I will be answering um, at, at the end of um, this webinar um, as, as we finish. Some of those questions might be answered as we go. If not, if not, I'm, I'm happy to answer them later. So um, if we think about uh, the kind of activity I spoke, I, I uh, talked about um, when I was setting up this task, remember, speak to your partner and did you agree with your partner? Um, that's an example of feedback on content. And um, again, in a lot of lessons I observe, it becomes very, very monotonous where the teacher simply asks the same uh, question to all of the students and imagine after every single speaking activity you ask the learners to report. Uh, the way our brain works is that it kind of switches off if it understands that we're not needed, we're not interested, we don't have to follow. So um, how can we do this online? And I'll just share a couple of examples I've seen in some lessons and I've done myself and in the online classes. So if we, if we ask our learners to speak in pairs and um, discuss something, and the question is, did you agree with your partner? Um, we can ask the learners to raise their hands if the answer is yes. Um, we, we can sometimes ask, I've seen that, um, the learners to put up a piece of colour paper, a marker of a specific colour, a pencil and something else to uh, say yes or something else to say no. 
Um, if we're learning some specific vocabulary, for example, um, stationary with young learners, we could also ask them to put up a pen if yes, or a ruler if no. Um, we can ask them to simply send yes into the chat or occasionally to ask, we, we can ask them to send a smiley or an emoticon into the chat. Um, a lovely example um, I've seen uh, is we can ask our learners to switch off their cameras if uh, they've agreed with their partner, but that's a dangerous path to take, especially with young learners and teenagers, because later on it can be uh, a little bit um, difficult to make the learners switch their cameras on again. Um, finally, we can also ask our learners to gesture, stand up, mind something um, to respond to this. We can definitely do this uh, in a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, and, and we sometimes do that, but in an online classroom, it, it becomes even more important because we want to keep the learner's attention um, and we want to keep them focused. Um, so, um, when we talk about feedback on content, because we're on this point, um, I'm, I'm going to share a dialogue with you um, and I'd like you to think about what happens there. It's, it's a piece of classroom interaction. So what happens there um, and what the problem is and maybe how we can fix it. Um, so have a look at this. And What's the problem there? <laughs> um, my question is more about the problem with the dialogue and with the interaction in general, because I can see some of you are correcting the mistake there. And yes, definitely. So we had pizza with cheese and mushrooms. Uh, but what's the, what, what's the problem? What's the problem with the kind of interaction there? Mm -hmm. um, I can see some people are writing something and I saw a very very nice comment in the chat that we have to do negative feedback sometimes but it has to be constructive which is a very fair comment and we definitely do have to give negative feedback otherwise um, if we simply praise our learners all the time and say yeah good great uh, our feedback loses value um, there is a difference between a task like, look at this picture, who is this? And that's, for example, um, one of the famous actresses. And we say, yeah, great. What's great about it? It is just knowing a face. Um, as opposed to uh, giving learners a difficult exercise and when they cope with it and uh, saying, yeah, great, well done, in response to this. And... Um, that's the kind of feedback based on the um, task and what they have to do. And we'll look at it a little bit later. So back to this task, the problem with this interaction is, as many of you are saying, that this feedback uh, is on language, um, that there's, there's been some feedback on language um, in between some feedback on content and the learner uh, is puzzled and the learner doesn't understand what happens and actually, as you can see at the end, gets frustrated. So um, the lesson from here, or actually two lessons to learn from here, is um, when we're doing feedback on content and when we're interested, genuinely interested in what our learners are saying, we have to be very careful about doing uh, feedback on language. Um, so in here, for instance, when the teacher corrected the mistake, uh, which was a good thing to do, but we had to actually listen to the learner's response. So in this interaction, if what happens is we correct a mistake and then our learner asks about it, we should go on and make sure the learner understands why they make the mistake and what the correct answer is before we can go back to feedback on content. So it will look like, you know, we're going in a straight line and then we suddenly deviate and then 
into feedback on language and then we go back and continue with the um, feedback on content. Um, there's this um, distinction between um, hearing and listening. Um, I can see a nice uh, comment in the chat. Um, um, you'll see, I'll just go back to this slide that uh, here in the interaction uh, at the end, the learner cries and somebody uh, pointed out the teacher cries too because of the misunderstanding or what. Uh, yes, that's fair. That's what happens in communication breakdown. And that's the point I'm making in this next slide. There's a big difference between uh, hearing and listening. Um, when we hear someone uh, at a physical action, that sound going into our ears, but all we see is blah, blah, blah. As you, as you can see in this picture, we're thinking about ourselves and what we are going to say. As opposed to listening, uh, where listening is actually an action um, of paying attention to what the other people are um, saying. And that's what, uh, as teachers, we should be doing. Um, remember the point I made earlier um, about 1.2 second delay, that it makes us look unfriendly and we should at least try and smile more. Uh, we should listen uh, more attentively when we're teaching online because uh, imagine there's a delay and imagine that we give feedback on something that our learner was not intending to um, hear or wasn't hoping to hear wasn't focusing it kind of gives us a full total communication breakdown so those are the two very very important rules um, to keep in mind um, and moving on to um, the next point I was making earlier is about feeding back and feeding forward, uh, which again, this, this comes from electrical engineering, which I'm not an expert in and not going to talk to uh, you about, but in an English language um, uh, and an English language learning classroom, uh, this um, distinction is very, very important where feeding back is telling our learners how they performed in the task, while uh, feeding forward is telling our learners what they should do and how they should do things uh, to uh, actually get where they want to be. So the uh, three key questions in uh, the idea of feeding forward uh, is where am I going? Uh, the three questions are where am I going? How am I doing? Uh, doing and where? Uh, what am I going to do next? Uh, where to? And some examples of how this can be done could be uh, marking draft of an essay submitted midterm. Um, if, for instance, you're working with young learners at schools and you want to uh, give an assignment so that they write a text about or they do a project about something. If halfway through we ask the learners to show us what they've done and help them correct their mistakes or guide them in the right direction, it will give them a lot more motivation and will help them uh, be more confident and perform better. Um, giving out checklists for tasks. Um, oh, going back to the previous point is uh, that's actually what we started doing on our CELTA courses. So like on CELTA, we give a uh, big assignment to our uh, candidates, actually four big assignments, which they have to complete and then we grade them. And um, not very recently, we've been doing this for a while now, um, uh, we started letting our uh, trainees show us some drafts or ask us questions and then we comment on those um, or we have individual consultation hours where we look at what they've produced and then we guide them to where they are, where, where they should be later. Um, and this has given us a lot more improvement in terms of how our learners, how our candidates perform with those assignments. Um, and the direct benefit for us as trainers is, of course, um, we don't have to mark any resubmissions. Imagine you get six assignments, you mark them and give them back, and then you have to mark them again. Not something everybody wants to do. Um, so with this new um, thing we do on our courses, we've, we, we have a lot 
fewer resubmissions every time. And that gives us less work. But also what happens is our learners understand what they have to do and how they have to get there. And we're all familiar with the concept of fossilized errors, which happen because, you know, we've been making the same mistake all over and over again, and we were never corrected. And um, if we can stop our learners halfway, correct that, uh, and help them progress, then we can help them avoid having this fossilized error. Um, so another example I was going to mention is giving out checklists for tasks, which is something I um, always encourage on Delta. If we give out a writing task for our learners, um, I always like to give a checklist of things such as, you know, how many paragraphs should be included, what words um, should be used, and some very, very particular things such as, please use those words because we studied them in this lesson, so make sure you do that or um, use this and this grammar, those and those linkers and, and stuff like that. Um, I know some people will disagree with this, especially if we talk about freer practice. And that brings me to the next point of telling the students what language to use. Uh, so the standard view is that in final practice and freer practice, we should not be telling our learners what language they have to use. We should give them a chance to experiment. However, um, sometimes if we want to feed forward, if you want to make sure that our learners are really there, we can have a checklist of the language the learners have to use on the board, on handouts. Um, and in some cases, we can even nominate some of the learners to be listeners um, or whatever you want to call them who actually listen uh, for the language which we assigned. And uh, that will help the learners to have more guided, more focused practice. Remember earlier I said that uh, we become experts with 10,000 hours of uh, practice which receives feedback. And this is an example of feedback which we receive when we listen for something um, specific uh, and make sure we hear it. Um, the other example would be stopping an activity halfway and, and doing feedback, or uh, we would call it feed forward in this case. Um, so here, um, if, if our learners are working on a speaking activity uh, and we see that they're not using our um, target language, say present continuous here, um, what, what we can do is we can stop the activity and have the learners listen to us and demonstrate what exactly we want them to do. Um, and, and then uh, our learners um, will see and get another model. Again, remember earlier I said that if our learners hand in a piece of writing and we grade it and we, we give it back immediately, our, our, our body receives a portion of dopamine. And exactly, this is exactly what happens if we stop an activity halfway and say, that's right, that's what you've been using. Those are examples of the present continuous we want to use. Okay, that's positive feedback. And, and that's what our learners get a model of and continue with um, into the next stages of the activity. And so basically, there's a lot of examples of feeding forward we can do um, in the class. And, and remember, we looked at some examples of feedback on content and feedback on language. And, and how can we um, transform feeding back into feeding forward? Um, so <clears throat> some, some very, very basic, very simple examples would be for number two, for instance, when we ask the learners how many people we spoke to in a mingling activity. Um, we, we can control this by, say, giving learners a number of uh, pieces of paper which they have to give to a learner they have spoken to. So, say, we want the learners to speak to five people each. So, everybody gets five pieces of paper. And once they've spoken to a learner, they need to give this piece of paper to their partner. So, they kind of exchange those. Um, to make sure that uh, they have spoken to the right people. And if those are all pieces of paper of different color, we can later see that, you know, they've spoken to different people, not the same people. 
Um, this uh, feeding forward is more important when it comes to doing feedback on language rather than feedback on content. And say, um, if, if the teacher, um, like in, in number five, the teacher asks learners to think about the tense she has just used in her story, um, we can feed forward there, we can make the learners focus on what we're going to do by saying that we're going to tell you um, a story um, and in this story we're going to, I'm going to use a tense or tenses and then um, later on uh, get the ideas from the learner. I would insist on putting them onto the board, visualizing those to make sure that the learners can keep track of what they said. So then we tell the story and later on we ask the learner this question, we say, so what, what structure, what tense did I use there? And the learners can compare what they predict um, to what they actually hear um, in our story. Uh, so that's an example of keeping the attention focused and feeding forward. Um, <clears throat> In, in number seven, the teacher writes up a word on the board which her learners produced incorrectly during speaking. Um, so an example here would be, uh, assuming that that's target language, an example of feeding forward here would be if we hear this happening, we, need, we would need to stop the activity uh, at some point and then do this kind of thing before the activity ends. Because imagine we're teaching uh, the language for places in town and our learners have pictures they have to describe and compare. And if we hear everybody uh, saying the word incorrectly, so something like police station as police station, if they say it seven, seven, eight, nine times, which they will have to uh, do, uh, this becomes fossilized. So I would insist on stopping the activity and getting the learners to repeat the word correctly. Um, and um, my final point I wanted to make is about feedback being constructive and deconstructive. Um, and um, I'm going to use a quote which um, I really like here. It's from a visual artist, but I think it's particularly relevant to what we do here. And it says that we navigate our whole lives using words and change and improve the words and I believe we can change and improve life. Um, and if we choose the right words, um, our learners hear the right words. And when we hear the right words, we get the right hormone, dopamine, not cortisol. Um, and that's how we become more motivated and we uh, want to continue learning. Um, and this is a very, very important concept in the modern ELT world and there's a lot about it. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard about um, the idea of mindset and fixed mindset and growth mindset in which uh, fixed mindset is we believe that we can do or cannot do something and growth mindset is we believe that we cannot do something yet and we can learn and uh, get there. So um, there's, there's a lot about that and I'll give you some links to a lovely TED talk um, by Angela Lee Duckworth who talks about her experience with this. But um, in our classroom, this results or this actually comes from the words we choose when giving feedback. And um, have a look at this sentence. When can we use those words? So here in, in, in the sentence, okay, so you didn't do as well as you wanted to. Let's look at this as an opportunity to learn. Um, earlier today, I said that negative feedback is negative feedback. It gives us um, cortisol uh, and we don't want to give negative feedback, but we do in the right time and for the right task. Um, so imagine a situation in which we have given a very, very weak learner a task to write up 
write a piece of essay. And they, they have done that, they have tried, but they have quite a lot of grammatical errors. Say they are pre-intermediate, but they have attempted third conditional, they have attempted something, um, they have attempted a variety of future forms. Um, and yes, they have made quite a lot of mistakes. And yes, we will want to correct those. But uh, those mistakes are a result of experimentation and an opportunity to learn. And, and this is a case in which it would be particularly relevant to acknowledge, to say that, yes, there are problems with what we've done, but uh, those show that we are learning and we are growing. And I'm going to give you some more examples um, of different pieces of feedback. And I'd like you to think about uh, how uh, and where um, it would be particularly relevant to use those. Um, so number two says, here are some strategies to figure this out. And when do you think we can use this? Would it be relevant uh, in response to a difficult task or a simpler task, maybe when the learners are making progress, maybe when they didn't make progress, maybe they struggled, maybe they did something wrong. Mm -hmm. I can see some answers in the chat, some complex ideas, difficult task. Yes. So we say that uh, this example, here are some strategies to figure this out. Um, we're, not, we're not praising our learners, we're not saying that they did well, uh, but this feedback is, is uh, quite neutral uh, and can be used in response to a difficult task which the learners haven't you know, coped with, um, again, as well as they wanted to or haven't coped at all. Um, so number three is your hard work is clearly um, evident in your project or essay. Again, this is something we can say in response to a difficult task um, where the learners are actually making some progress um, and they are doing something well. Um, while number four, uh, if you look at it, you're ready for something more difficult is a piece of feedback uh, which basically says, I think that, that that was too easy for you or you didn't try hard enough. And, and here uh, we're telling the learners that uh, they can do better than that. They can do more and they can tackle more complex tasks. And this is actually a piece of motivating feedback which tells our learners that we believe in them. Um, and you will see that um, at the bottom I have a link and, and this is a resource which, which I've taken those pieces of feedback from. Um, and, and that's a handout basically with um, different things you can say in response to a task depending on the level of difficulty of this task. And I often use it when uh, speaking to uh, my learners um, about the kind of task they do, especially in exam preparation classes, when I know that they've attempted this type of task uh, already and today they're not particularly focused or not trying hard enough and say, uh, I want to show them that I know they're not particularly uh, careful with this task. And, and they hear it and, and they respond to it. Uh, like I said earlier, if we say, yes, great, perfect, in response to a simple task, this devalues our yes, great, perfect. And our learners will not want to work hard to get this kind of feedback. Um, so to sum up a little bit, um, just a, final, uh, a few final notes on feedback. We say that feedback should be easily understandable uh, and um, that should mean both uh, verbal and non-verbal feedback. Um, we want to say that it should be constructive and motivating um, and we want to make sure that our learners benefit from it. Feedback should be timely. Remember, uh, giving feedback on a piece of writing now as opposed to later. And feedback should be memorable. Um, 
we talk about cognitive anchors, um, which uh, help our learners remember what we want them to remember. I still remember one of my colleagues who um, used to um, have funny mimes and gestures and things in response to uh, students' errors. And one example would be when students uh, were making a third person S mistake, whatever level it was, beginner, uh, intermediate, upper intermediate, a person would uh, uh, make a funny face and start jumping and run to the window and say, if I hear this mistake again, I'm going to jump out of that window. And, you know, it's funny the first, the second and the third time. But when you see... Uh, the person's face the fourth time you understand that oh no not again i've made the silly third person s mistake and it creates the anchor we want to create create um and and next time uh we're going to have this face in in front of our eyes even before we make this mistake that's how our brain works and um, feedback should tell the learners how to do things correctly and and that's my point about feeding forward if we want to tell, if we want our learners to use uh, present continuous in the free practice, sometimes uh, it's best to tell them to use this present continuous. It will make it semi-controlled practice. It's not entirely freer, but it will uh, let the learners know what we want from them and how to get there. Um, we say that feedback should be accurate and, and maybe not should, maybe must be accurate. Uh, we want to give our learners correct information because that's what stays with them and and the final note is that feedback should be um, empowering i'm just going to go back to the slide with my favorite quote um, we navigate our whole lives using words and change and improve the words and i believe that we can change and improve life and that's true and that's true about all areas of life not only feedback how we speak to our um, friends, relatives, colleagues, and everyone else also has a lot of impact on how they perceive the information. Remember the thing about dopamine and cortisol. Um, and um, I think I'll be finishing there. Um, you can see uh, my contact details, my email on this slide. And if you need anything, if you have questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer the questions. You can email me um and uh, you will receive this presentation um if i'm right but is that correct federica yeah 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 Anything else? Yeah. But... Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to, to check yep. if uh, we're going to be sending the presentation. So, yes. Um, so, um, on this note, I think I just wanted to thank everyone. I've been reading some of the comments, and I know people have been talking about feedback quite a lot. And, and it's great that you have so many ideas and, and so many comments. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here uh, today. Thanks for uh listening to this webinar and and for um your time and if you have any questions i think we can still have just a couple of minutes to answer them um federica maybe you could 